The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Believe it or not, there is a long history of Bigfoot sightings in Texas. The style of rock art is totally unique to this part of Texas and northern Mexico. Working with people on keeping the bears wild, keeping them out of town, keeping them out of the trash, keeping them in their native range. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. said he got this overwhelming feeling of something watching him. He saw this figure of what he first thought was a big person. It was covered in hair. It was standing completely upright. And he said at that point, he just turned and ran out of those woods. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> kind of spooky and scary, right? Each year, thousands of people report sightings of huge hair-covered bipedal creatures these are the most terrifying encounters with Bigfoot. Welcome once again to the Monstro Bizarro podcast. I'm your host, Lyle Blackburn. 13-year-old Johnny Maples was walking along a road near the town of Jefferson, Texas, when he heard a noise in the bushes. As far back as I can remember, I just loved monsters first movie monsters, but later sightings of possible real-life monsters. Those really captured my imagination. I grew up camping and hunting, and so I spent so much time in the woods, and I guess thinking back, I always felt like it also held some mystery. He just didn't look like anything I'd ever seen. I thought at first it might be some kind of a wild man, but I couldn't tell all that hair just what it was. That was really cemented when I saw a movie called The Legend of Boggy Creek back in the 1970s. And that movie dramatized sightings of a Bigfoot-like creature in southwest Arkansas, not too far from where I lived. Obviously, that's had a great influence on me. I love that, and I've been lucky enough <laughs> that my life has gone in a direction where I can still love these things and essentially make a career out of it. I was really enthralled with the stories of people in modern times saying they saw something that, that essentially is a monster or something that we would think of out of folklore. Just about the time man, in all his wisdom, decides that he has this world and everything in it all figured out, along comes something he can't explain. Take the recent reports of the Lake Worth monster, or creature, or whatever you want to call it. One of the most famous monster tales from Texas is the Lake Worth monster, in what is now the Fort Worth Nature Center. Right here on July 11th, 1969, 30 to 40 witnesses saw some kind of upright hairy creature run up on a limestone cliff, grab an old tire and throw it 400 feet across the heads of the onlookers. Let's see if they talk about wildlife such as the Lake Worth monster. Oh, there it is, mythological wildlife. 50 oh my gosh. 
That eventually got reported in the newspapers, which furthered the story that there was some kind of strange creature lurking in the woods here at Lake Worth. So I want to do a presentation today on one of the most famous Texas legends, monster stories. It's commonly called the Lake Worth Monster. So there was multiple witnesses right off the bat to what was going on. They showed him the car and there's a big long scratch down the car. There's no doubt that people saw something. I'm Lyle Blackburn. Thank you so much. Thank you. Long time. Okay, When's the first one you came to? It's been a while. <laughs> We're selling raffle tickets and somebody will take him home. Even Bigfoot could take little Bigfoot home. I started the conference over 20 years ago and it just brings a group of like-minded people that are into the same thing you're into. Well, thank you. This is the Bigfoot capital of Texas because this is an epicenter of Bigfoot activity, uh, Bigfoot sightings. The shops in town sell Bigfoot memorabilia, souvenirs, shirts, ball caps. A lot of the restaurants have a menu item named after Bigfoot. The town has really embraced it and just having a good time. Even if you're not interested in Bigfoot, just get outdoors. Even if we don't see a Bigfoot or get evidence of a Bigfoot, we're still outdoors enjoying nature and the woods. What's better than that? What about over here? Now we're looking to capture here our alligator snapping turtles. Tomorrow we will have some real proof of some monsters that live in the creeks <laughs> around here. Bigfoot to me is a representative of the wilderness. It's a representative of the woods. It's the mystery. What's behind that tree? What's behind that thicket? It's an idea. It's the idea of the unknown. And when I was a kid, the movie came out. It was called The Legend of Boggy Creek. It scared me as much as it fascinated me by this idea of some creature walking up and down the creeks and bayous. So I was set and determined as a kid, I'm gonna go find Bigfoot. Well, going out, I never found Bigfoot. I never found any sign of Bigfoot. But I did find coyote tracks and bobcat tracks. Yeah, here we can see the raccoon tracks. Here you can see the individual toes in the little foot pad, really cool. And I got field guides and I learned what these tracks were, what the plants were. So all this time I never found Bigfoot, but I found something else. And I found the thing that led me to what I do today. Actually, one of the first calls I responded to was an alleged Bigfoot sighting. It looks more like toes were kind of squeezed into the soil where you have a much deeper profile on the toes than you do actually in the heel where the vast majority of the weight is going to be. What in the world is this creature? Where did he come from? And what does he eat? Are questions I've heard discussed a, a, a thousand times around winter fires. I guess I'd have to be called a Bigfoot agnostic, you know? Uh, I'm there, but I'm not all the way there yet. But you have to have the storytellers, you have to have the skeptics, and you have to have the audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those kids who get out in the woods love the woods, and if, they, if it wasn't for Bigfoot, they may have never stepped foot. So you gotta yeah. put a huge value on that. And it's leading people to go outside. It's leading people to go outside and go, this is beautiful, this is wonderful, we need to protect this. Enjoy the mystery, enjoy outdoors and nature. 
and you know have fun with it. But if you do come to Falk, Arkansas, it's a great place to live till the sun goes <laughs> down. Go down. <laughs> and then they all go. Ah. <laughs> yeah, you got to keep it scary. <laughs> Terlingua, DB's barbecue, sure draws a crowd. When a special visitor became a regular, they knew they had to do something about it. Coming to the restaurant in the mornings, and we'd see it, it was a mess. Something was, uh, you know, piddling with the dumpsters, but we didn't exactly know what animal it was, you know. And uh, eventually, we, we caught him red-handed. Communicated with the waste management company. We got them to get us some bear proof dumpsters out here and since we got those we hadn't had any problem. Once common across Texas, black bears were extirpated from the state by the 1950s. Today sightings are on the rise, signaling that the deserts of West Texas may once again be bear country. Just north of DB's barbecue, residents of Terlingua Ranch are also learning to live with bears. We've had multiple bears here to Terlingua Ranch. One in particular was a female, and uh, she was coming around a lot. That's when I, I think I decided to call the Parks and Wildlife and talk to a biologist about it. Me too. How are you? Good, good. He came down and said he could help me with some issues concerning our bird feeder and help me electrify that. The wire's holding up pretty good. Yeah, I, I tighten it periodically, but it really is working good. And keep the bear from destroying that all the time. And, and also the dumpster, he helped us with those. It's made all the difference in the world. That helps us live together with the bears. They kind of figure it out, all right, they're not gonna get a free meal. Yep, and we're not trying working with people on keeping the bears wild, uh, keeping them out of towns, keeping them out of trash, keeping them in their native range, um, and it's been working really well. We're able to really live in harmony with them. If we see a black bear walking through, we don't have a big problem with that. And they're not destroying the dumpsters and not getting into the bird feeder. And We think this has been a huge help. I hope it continues down here. Sounds good. The camaraderie and the cooperation between Parks and Wildlife and us locals that live here has been a big help. I think it'll help the bear population in the long run. The future looks bright for the bears and for the people living here. We're out here on uh, Seagram's East Beach. We have a little uh, cut that comes out. That's uh, the fresh water from inside the marsh going out to the beach. I do have uh, some uh, chicken necks that are already tied up to the string here. It's like fishing. Yeah, what's on it? Yeah. I didn't have any idea it would involve chicken. I thought you would sort of cast a net, pull them in, and, and it would be done. <laughs> I'm going to throw that thingy again because I let go of it. Good job. Here. Been in Southeast Texas 15 years. This is my first time. Not the crabbies. Oh, it's great. The kids are having a blast, and we are too. I think I'm having more fun than the kids. Oh. Mom. He's trying to pull him in. Dang it. Well, just hang on. He may come back. I can't see him. I can't see him. I don't know how to look for water. Do you? Uh-uh. I still don't feel one. Big one? Let me show you how you measure these crabs, okay? It needs to be at least five inches. It is a keeper. Big. It's a lot of fun to watch the kids. What's stuck in the sand? Just relax and, and get dirty and get wet. Oh my God. That's been really fun to watch. Yay. And my feet are clean. Super, super, super fun. Oh, you got one, Matthew. Oh. Look at there, Matt. That's a keeper. Daddy, can I eat that right in my mouth? <laughs>
It is fun. <laughs> <laughs> Was it tickling you? Yeah. And it wasn't as gross as I thought it would be in the beginning. <laughs> oh. And I've learned a lot about crabs today. That was, that was huge. So we are at the beautiful Seminole Canyon State Park and Historic Site, located about 40 miles west of Del Rio. We're right on the border of West Texas. So we have a pretty rugged terrain here. You'll notice there's not a lot of trees. It looks a little desolate. We have rocky limestone surface with stunning sheer walled canyons. When you take the time to stop, go down in the canyon, it becomes a whole new world. It's just such a magical place down in, in Seminole Canyon. The lower Pecos rock art that you see here in Seminole Canyon dates between 5,500 and 1,500 years ago. The best way to really enjoy Seminole Canyon is to go on one of our, our daily rock art tours. When limestone heats and cools at that intense. You get to go down into the canyon, see things that you wouldn't be able to see just by driving by the park. This style of rock art is totally unique to this part of Texas and northern Mexico. It still speaks to our history and heritage here in, in North America that might rewrite history. The artists had to have a ladder. The stories that these ancient folks are telling us may be a survival, make sure that next generation could survive in this environment. It really makes you feel awe and wonder when, when you're looking at it and thinking about all the process that went into it. So our Maker of Peace statue, which is one of our iconic landmarks here in the park, depicts no one single figure in the rock art, but it's kind of an amalgamation inspired by some of the motifs that you see throughout the rock art. The artist, Bill Worrell, got into creating art inspired by Lower Pecos rock art he decided to, to go on and open a studio where he created all kinds of art like the Maker of Peace. If you're not that much of a history buff, we have something for everyone. We have a bird blind for people who are interested in checking out the birds that are here in the, the park. There's a male and a female. He's got a black and white head. So pretty. We have hiking and biking trails, as well as, as campsites and day use picnic areas available. A lot of our visitors are very pleasantly surprised when they stop in here. They think it's just going to be a quick stop. There's a lot more waiting for them here than just a campsite. I hope that folks who stop here get to feel a little sense of wonder at just this beautiful place and the amazing things and amazing views that we have in the park. Hunting obviously is a huge deal in the state of Texas. Yes. She's down. And a lot of families have grown up getting outside together, going hunting, doing that. So if you wanted to go hunting in Texas prior to the availability of digital licenses, that meant you had to have a physical license that has tags on it to be able to legally go possess those game animals upon harvest. We printed off on site at the point of sale. Thanks, sir. You would take that license with you, and that had to be on you while you were hunting and make sure that you had that physically available when you harvested an animal. She fell down. Our customers, I think they were looking for something a little bit easier for them when it came to licensing and tagging. 
Well, we've had an option for digital proof of license for some time. But if you harvested an animal, there was no mechanism available with that digital proof of license to actually complete a tag and show that you had correctly tagged that animal. The project that we undertook now was to create that digital tagging implementation where when you harvested an animal, not only did you have your, have your digital proof of license, but you were able to actually go ahead and execute a tag for that harvest as well. Beginning this past hunting season, we have for the first time ever in Texas, the ability for you to digitally tag a, a deer, turkey upon harvest, as opposed to having to have that, that old school paper license that you uh, carry in your wallet. Having a digital tagging option, it's no different than having a paper. Instead of getting your wallet out of your, you know, your pocket and pulling your license out and you tearing a tag and writing on it, you just pull your phone out and you open the app and you answer a few questions and boom, you're done. The, the project was given a very tight timeline. We found out in August of 2021 that we would need to deliver something by the very next license year. And so we had about 12 months to deliver this. We also do parks and parks has its own app. And uh, this was a major undertaking. I think the folks that are aware of it in terms of the public, uh, it's a huge hit. We were estimating at some point that we thought we might sell about 50,000 of these digital licenses in this first pilot year. And we ended up selling over 80,000 but we received only a few hundred requests for support with more than 80,000 licenses sold. So the app was extremely successful. Customers adapted to it with no problems. So first we're gonna look at the license catalog. One of the best things about this was it brought everyone from all different corners of the agency together in one sole focus mission. This project was all about providing more options for our customers in the field to help them get outside.
This series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places.